Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here, and thanks again, Action Duchenne, for having me. Um, um, why me? Why do you need a cardiologist? Um, we know that dystrophin is important to maintain the cell uh, structure and function, and we know that dystrophin is expressed in all muscles, including, importantly, the heart. And what I would like to highlight is that because of their heart beating continuously, heart involvement in Duchenne does not start at the age of 10 or 12. The heart is involved from the start. And that's because there is an ongoing damage and repair process that is um, compromised by the dystrophinopathy. And what we tend to see is that as the disease progresses, we start seeing more of the signs of this um, heart involvement. And it begins with subtle ECG abnormalities to begin with. Then the heart may find it a bit difficult to relax and therefore fill up with blood properly. Then if you look hard using MRI, you might start seeing some scarring in the heart, um, followed by the heart kind of dilating and getting bigger. And eventually, you start having the pump uh, issues that cause the uh, syndrome of heart failure. And because of the overlap with the skeletal problems, the heart failure as a syndrome, which uh, comprises, importantly, symptoms of breathlessness or um, fluid accumulation, etc., is quite a, a late, if at all present, feature of heart involvement in Duchenne. And that has historically led to uh, poor cardiac care uh, decades ago, because people just did not recognize the importance of the heart involvement in that. And I put a question mark next to symptoms because even in patients with quite advanced heart involvement and cardiomyopathy, um, symptoms may be absolutely absent. And that's why it's important that we rely on objective tests to see where we are with uh, the heart. Um, this kind of simplistic way of approaching um, the heart involvement in Duchenne uh, has been proposed, and I, I think it's useful to think of it in those three stages. There is the preclinical stage where, um, yes, the heart is involved, but there isn't much to see uh, in terms of uh, the damage that you um, would find if you look for. And that is typically up to the age of six, um, up to 10. And then the clinical stage is the uh, longest stage where you start seeing things like the enzymes of the heart going up, uh, suggesting an ongoing um, kind of damage and repair. Um, you can see signs of the heart stretching through blood tests, and you can also see more uh, obvious kind of uh, abnormalities on the ECG. And then you end with uh, the kind of more advanced stages of the disease where the heart is really stretched and weak. And the goal of the therapy really is to keep the heart as, as strong as possible for as long as possible by interfering with this damage and repair process. So a little bit of an overview of what the heart checks and what do we do to, to um, kind of uh, check on what's where we are with the um, heart involvement. The simplest and most non-invasive one is an ECG, which um, essentially gives us a snapshot of the electrical um, situation of the heart that tells us how fast the heart is going, what the rhythm of the heart is, and importantly, it can give us important clues uh, regarding how the electrical wave front is, is moving across the heart, and that can tell us if there are little parts of the heart muscle that is not contracting very well. But the best way to do that is to look actually at the structure and the function of the heart with an echocardiogram, an ultrasound scan of the heart, um, and what that does is it uh, gives us a, a, a good comprehensive view of what the heart structure is like, is it pumping well, what the valves of the heart alike, and um, the main chamber that we look for um, in uh, kind of these assessments is the left ventricle, because that's the one that is the main pumping chamber that pushes the uh, oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Um, you can do um, a heart MRI, which looks at the heart in a more kind of um, detailed way. Um, it can also importantly detect that scarring that can happen in the heart muscle, uh, which is an early sign of potential heart uh, kind of dysfunction. 
ultrasound is great, but it can be prone to operator uh, use, so you can make the window look a bit better, or you can get your line to stop one way or another when you're ma making measurements, uh, while an MRI is a bit more objective. Um, but the downside is that if, if you've ever had an MRI, and I didn't until recently because of my head, it's an awful experience, really. Um, to have to lie flat in 30 to 40 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, in a very noisy machine, um, having to take, um, you know, breaths on, on cue, it's, um, it's not the easiest. And in fact, we know that we sometimes need to use general anesthetic to help um, uh, Duchenne boys kind of have their scans. Um, we also need to give a contrast, uh, which means, um, you know, issues with access and potentially reaction to the contrast itself. And uh, theoretically, not everyone may be suitable for it because of their metal work, but it, practically it's not a, an issue that I've encountered. Now, the mainstay of cardiac medication therapy, and I'm not going to talk about steroids, which have been covered uh, extensively, but from a heart perspective, these are the three medications that we want every Duchenne patient to be on. We want an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, ACE inhibitor. Um, these reduce the workload on the heart, so they interfere with the damage side of the damage repair process by making the heart work less hard by reducing the blood pressure afterwards. We call it afterload. But also importantly, they seem to interfere with the repair process as well and um, maintain the heart pumping function for longer. But um, almost as a, as a downside for them, which is their primary use elsewhere actually, they can lower blood pressure. So blood pressure is my enemy in clinic because I want to give more. I want to, but that's the limiting step for us. Um, beta blockers, they don't lower blood pressure that much, but what they do is they, they slow the heart down and make it work less vigorously, less hard. Um, and again, they are very important, and I'll go to the evidence, a little bit of the evidence as to why they are important in um, Duchenne care. And finally, um, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, um, or <laughs> MRAs, these are also very important. They seem to affect the fibrosis side of things, so they prevent the scar um, from happening in the heart. So this is a, a landmark study, really, that took um, boys with Duchenne with normal hearts and gave them either um, placebo, and each dot, black dot here represents the function of uh, someone with um, a normal heart and no ACE inhibitor, and the dots represent those who received uh, ACE inhibitor, which is perindopril in that study. And they followed them up up to five years. And what you can see is at three years, things are fairly comparable. Uh, but at five years, those who uh, t kept on taking perindopril maintained the heart function for longer. And importantly, when they looked at longer-term follow-up, that seemed to have correlated with improved survival. So um, I'll cover this later, but ACE inhibitors are really very, very important in the patient's care with Duchenne. And we say that you should start them whenever you see abnormalities um, on the heart checks, but again, no later than the age of 10 years old. Beta blockers um, have tons of evidence for their use and uh, how good they are in terms of heart failure or cardiac function in the adult population, the data for their use, specifically in Duchenne, is scarce. And that is, I think, to do with some ethical issues with that, because it's hard to say, here's a tablet that we know works, but I'm going to not give it to you. But actually, this is pretty much what happened years ago um, in Japan, where they were quite honest with families, and they said, we don't know if it will work or not. You can opt in to take it or not. And the majority, um, I think 41 uh, in this study, uh, took it versus only 13, and the findings were staggering. So they found that um, beta blockers protected against heart problems, and again, importantly, they protected against mortality. So they too are very, very important in um, the care of a Duchenne patient. A plerinone, which is the, an example of an MRA, um, was again studied in this um, very important uh, placebo-controlled trial. Um, 
which gave either a plenanone or a, a placebo to boys with Duchenne and normal hearts. And what they found with, within a year that those on uh, a plenanone maintained the cardiac function. Um, and when they studied exactly how that happened using MRIs, they saw that there was less a scar, as you can see here, compared to those with um, a pleuronone. Um, so these medications have been recognized for some time to be important in, in uh, treatment of Duchenne from a heart perspective, and guidelines have been formulated uh, over the years. Um, they do stress that you need to see a cardiologist, um, that you need to have some tests, um, and that you need to have medications started. But, and also there is a mention of the um, involvement for carriers. But what, one of the feedback we received, um, and as uh, Marie kindly mentioned earlier, we have too much wiggle room with this, such that people can interpret it as they want. And with the lack of um, evidence for some of these parts, not all clinicians were very happy to prescribe everything and, and uptitrate. So this is uh, how the MDK UK kind of project uh, came to light and the cardiac care part of it involved um, importantly patient representative and their families um, with collaboration with Newcastle University and North Star Network. And the goal was to agree and publish these guidelines uh, to standardize care across the UK. Um, so this paper is uh, published in uh, Open Heart, meaning it's uh, open access and it's free to download. Uh, and the lead author is my friend and mentor, Dr. Burke. Um, I will go in a little bit into this kind of uh, flow diagram just to sp specify what we uh, have agreed and that everyone should get an echocardiogram and an ECG um, no later than age 10. And then if you find any heart weakness at any stage, you go down this route where you start the medications and adjust to titration, to, to response and tolerability. Uh, and if you don't, then you need to repeat the assessments regularly uh, every one to two years. Um, and by age 10, ideally you should be on treatment or you'll be looking very hard uh, for the reason not to. So you have to have no fibrosis on MRI to justify not starting treatment, really. Um, and now this is where I come in as an adult cardiologist because most of my Duchenne patients are in this stage, really, um, which is tweaking, fine-tuning, increasing, adding, uh, and responding to, to the dynamic um, kind of situation, which is life, really, where patients end up with problems and you have to um, increase the medications or suspend them. Um, and we have, in addition to these three medications, uh, some few other medications that we now are getting more experience using. So sacubital balsartan, also known as Entresto, has good evidence base for its use in the non-DMD population. Uh, and we're starting to extend that into the DMD um, care I have a handful of patients on Entresto, and they seem to tolerate it well. The published literature on it is pretty much non-existent, so that's one area of uh, research that we're thinking that we need to kind of look into. Um, as the heart involvement and cardiomyopathy progresses, then you start having problems with the electrical side of things, so you can have the heart go a bit too slow or too fast, and that's where we need to look a bit harder uh, particularly if we see signs of heart involvement on an ECG, and we might do things like a halter monitor to look at uh, the heart in a longer period, because as an ECG, as you know, is a 10-second snapshot. Um, then there is a role of uh, pacemakers or uh, even uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy pacemakers where we get the heart to beat in a bit more synchronized way. Um, then there is a risk of atrial arrhythmias, um, and we... Um, treat that as we do for uh, um, non-DMD population with beta blockers and uh, blood thinners. Um, if the heart function is very severe, or very severely impaired, I should say, then we know that there is a risk of life-threatening heart rhythms. Um, and this is one of the trickiest parts of, of my clinic, where I'd have someone with 
um, a heart pumping function and measured by an ejection fraction of, let's say, 20%. Um, so I know that they're at risk of sudden death. But equally, they are at risk of sudden death from competing issues. And therefore, it's very important that we have a, an open and honest chat with the patient and their families about their risk, about their wishes. And in some people, it's entirely appropriate that we uh, offer a defibrillator, and I have a few with defibrillators. But in others, having that would actually mean more harm than good, because the device can, in itself, getting it inserted, can have lots of issues around the surgery or the procedure. And then there is an ongoing risk, particularly of the device getting infected, because it's a man-made thing. The body doesn't depend, defend it very well, particularly if you have lots of steroids on board. So um, that is one of the trickiest part, I think, in uh, looking after someone with Duchenne. Um, and then there are some more advanced therapies that we are again borrowing from the non-DMD population, um, which help with um, heart pumping function and keeping people out of hospital, really. Um, and as I said, if the heart pumping function falls progressively, we have the advanced treatments uh, that may or may not help, really. So we have things like digoxin um, to help the heart pump stronger. There is virtually no evidence for its use in that population, but it's one of those things that we still do uh, as an expert consensus sort of um, position. Um, we use loop diuretics, so furzamide, uh, bumetanide, to help with the leg swelling uh, and the breathing. That difficulty that can happen if you have advanced heart um, involvement. Um, this is very hard. Uh, it's mostly applicable, I would say, to the uh, other types of dystrophinopathy. Uh, but advanced uh, heart failure management, including you know, heart transplants or ventricular assistant, uh, assistant devices, um, they come with much more risk with very potential, uh, potentially very little reward. So that would be hard to apply to Duchenne patients. And I think that's also the other very tricky part of uh, the care because it's hard to bring it out to the open and say, right, we have reached the limit of what we can do. Um, we are at a, a stage where we know that the heart is really quite badly affected and therefore there is risk of um, sudden death. We need to accept this reality and deal with it now when we can have the chat as opposed to later when things are difficult. And that's when emergency healthcare planning um, comes in. Um, importantly from that um, publication, there were a number of questions, and I'm not going to go through them all, but they highlight what you should expect to have from a center of care for cardiology. Um, they, do you have a dedicated cardiologist? Um, have you had the chat about what it means to the heart for having Duchenne? Do you have regular assessments? Have you had your first assessment in a timely manner? Are you on the right to treatment? Um, and do you make sure that you're actually seeing your patient as opposed to those remote reviews? Because seeing patients, uh, particularly w with the ability to do the tests, uh, influences how you manage them. Um, DMDK UK has published the same kind of guidelines in a uh, kind of patient and family friendly version that you can access uh, from the Shen UK website. And it really just summarizes what I've been saying, that you want um, to check for heart involvement at the age of six, that from then onwards you need to have regular checks and to start treatment by the age 10. And throughout adolescence, you want to make sure that the medications are optimized to the patient, their weight, and their needs. If I have time, uh, I would just like to briefly touch on um, the female carriers and the heart involvement in that. So um, I put carriers there between quotation marks as we heard from Dr. Sharkozy and others yesterday that this term can be problematic because it doesn't um, explain the cardiac involvement um, um, and other parts as well. So previously it was believed that the lifetime risk of cardiomyopathy in a Duchenne carrier is up to one, you know, 20%. So one out of five ladies with um, the gene may have a heart involvement. But I disagree with that. I think um, it's much more because it depends on how hard you look. Um, and this is um, an MRI study that looked really hard and found that up to two-thirds of uh, women with 
the Duchenne gene have some sort of abnormality of their heart when you look hard enough. Um, so the guidelines also talk about this and say that anyone who, um, any lady who has confirmed um, Duchenne genetic mutation needs to have uh, a cardiac assessment. That's so we can go over the rationale as to why we do heart surveillance, the role of heart treatment. Um, we talk about the assessments, and if they are fine, then we schedule the next review, uh, recommended to be about two to three years. Um, if the assessments are equivocal, we either look harder with an MRI or uh, take a pragmatic decision and start treatment then. And if they are abnormal, then we start uh, medications. And the treatment is very similar to the Duchenne, um, you know, the triple therapy, so to speak, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and MRAs. Um, this is something that I spend a lot of my time responding to queries to. So um, these medications are there to help protect the heart long term. But if there is a short term thing, an illness, they can reduce the blood pressure significantly. And a lot, uh, almost a, a, a reflex in a and &E is to stop everything else. And, and, and that's fine. But we need to get them back on board as soon as feasible. And we need to ensure that if um, our Duchenne patient is unwell, that they are very well hydrated. And it's okay to suspend their medications while they're unwell. It's absolutely fine. But we need to restart them as soon as possible, ideally during the recovery period. Um, and also importantly, um, that if we have um, a Duchenne carrier who's an ACE inhibitor who's thinking about having a family, we need to know and we need to let them know that the ACE inhibitors can actually um, be very harmful to their fetus. So we can stop them or change them to something um, that is safe and compatible with pregnancy. So um, my take home messages are this, these. So the heart is always involved. Um, the heart pumping function, if we don't deteriorate, uh, if we don't treat it, can deter deteriorate over time. And that really there is no um, alternative to starting treatment early. When we see someone uh, as an adult who not started uh, medications early, and luckily this is a very rare scenario, uh, the ship would have sailed. We can't, we can't re recover the heart pumping function by then. Um, symptoms are only a small part and they hardly ever uh, appear, and if they do, it's uh, at the end of stage of the condition. Um, and that you need to have regular checks. Steroid therapy is helpful. And uh, you, you need to keep um, on the heart medications because they are very important and well tolerated. And importantly, you need to know your rights. Make sure that you have a cardiologist. Make sure that they know that these guidelines exist and um, that you're getting the care that you need. Um, I too would like to acknowledge uh, the working group members, the North Star Network, and Duchenne UK and Newcastle University, and of course the very kind uh, funders. Um, and I would like to especially acknowledge my friend and mentor, Dr. Beck. Thank you very much. <laughs>